plenty of challenges going forward and, and those impact on revenues. So if you were going to have a year where you gain $3 million in, in, in fund balance, that was the year to do it because there's certainly uh, a couple of very difficult budgets coming up, if not more. For, for uh, Mr. Lamarca's benefit, so typically what happens is at the end of the school year, in June, we um, make a recommendation to the board, Sue, to Sue and I make a recommendation to the board to take some of that fund balance and distribute it into those restricted reserves. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to page four, typically uh, that blue uh, in the, in the uh, 1920 year, that, that blue uh, um, area is a lot less. It's, it's in those 1.7 million you know, uh, yep. areas, and those are pushed up into the green reserves, those restricted so we're kind of, like I mentioned in my weekly update on Friday, we're kind of waiting to see what happens with the aid. And, and then maybe, hopefully in January, we'll have some type of a better picture with our crystal ball. And we'll make that recommendation to the board at that time that whatever fund balance we have left above that 4%, we will shove it into those reserves at that time. So just because you weren't, you weren't part of that last year, so previous years, just for your benefit. Any any questions, concerns? All right. Thank Thanks you. for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you for coming out. Our second uh, presentation for the evening. Dr. Evie and Mr. Jamato. Mostly Mr. Jamato. Mostly, mostly Mr. Jamato. Uh, every student student succeed that for Messi. Right. Yes. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, all right. Take your over. So, sure. Thank you. Always yeah, that's it. Notification, nature, fire other. Location, 128 Ledyard Avenue. Remark, order of that gas in the basement. It's not here, right? John? Nope. John, 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 all right, every student succeeds at it. Um, basically, this act is a replacement for No Child Left Behind. And although it replaced No Child Left Behind, it, it didn't eliminate, it, it modified the periodic testing that schools are mandated to give. Um, and it put a little bit more, there we go. And it's to me, that font's awful, I'm sorry about that. Um, the main purpose is to make sure schools provide a quality education for all students. Um, and, and it really focuses on subgroups, which is a big difference. And the four key groups are students in poverty, minority groups, students with uh, special needs, and those with limited English skills, our ELL students. Um, some things we need to consider when we're thinking about ESSA and the reports that we get. We get a school report card and a district report card every year that's publicly accessible on the state ed website. And you can look it up for any school or district. It is that you're going to find, as I go through this, that each building has different subgroups reported because it's based on size. If we don't have the right threshold, that subgroup isn't counted in totality. Although for some of the reporting, the state will gather subgroups. Um, over the course of a couple years to, uh, to measure their growth. Um, so we have different subgroups based on size and based on cohort. And like I said, they do combine the cohorts to determine status. Um, luckily, we don't have to worry about these, these terms right now, TSI and CSI schools. But basically, those are schools that are chronically low performing. And if you notice, it's... Um, over a three-year span. And so what the state does when they send us our report card 
is to identify groups that are on the margin of low performing. And so we can, you know, we know what a potential um, CSI or TSI group is going to be. And then we can make plans for that. And then um, it's the CSI is determined by five different scenarios, and it's it's a, they give us a table with a lot of ifs and thens that we have to go through and match different scores for the different groups and see how it all fares out. What we what we monitor for accountability purposes is um, what the composite level, performance level, the growth level. Um, the combined composite and growth level, and beginning this year, if, if everything goes as they said, we're going to also start reporting suspensions, um, English language proficiency, again that's for our ESL students, ELA and math progress, chronic absenteeism, and high school only is um, college and career readiness. And out of all those categories, four of them are based on the different assessments in grades four to eight in the elementary and middle school in the um, high school regents exams. So just in a nutshell, um, composite performance is, it's a and it's only grades four to eight for this, it's a combined um, measure for ELA math and science. And it's, it's annual student performance. Academic progress is, um, how the students are doing in relation to the state's long-term goals. They establish goals for us in each school district and school individually based on their performance when they started this. And we have to meet their measures of growth. Um, again, student growth is how they do on state assessments in math in ELA 4 to 8 um, compared to students of a, a similar grouping. So if we have an economically disadvantaged group um, how they scored last year compared to the rest of the state. They actually do like a ranking with similar groups to see how we measure up for that growth. Um, the ELP students, our ESL students, it's measured on the NISA slot. Um, it'll be interesting to see what our report cards look like this year because last year we had no state assessments. So um, all, I know like for the ESL kids, all their levels stay the same. So if they were at like transitioning last year, a student, he started this year transitioning because we have no measure to move him forward. In chronic absenteeism, um, basically based on October 7th this year, our bed state, any student who's enrolled on that day who is absent 10% or more of the time. And so absenteeism is a very big deal. So 9 to 12, it's very similar, and I hope I didn't cut you off. Um, again, it's based on the composite, it's based on ELA, Mass, Socialist, and Science Regents. Academic progress, again, is based on long-term goals, just like the middle and elementary. Um, the ELP is exactly the same, absenteeism is the same. And then they look at graduation rate for the high school based on four, five, and six years after first entering grade nine. So it's based on the co cohort they start high school with. And then college and career readiness has to do with advanced credits, credentials, and CTE certifications. So things like our AP, or not our AP, like our, our um, Academy of Finance, advanced regents diplomas, those all count towards college and career readiness. So just to review the schools, our high school's in good standing overall, and the subgroups I've listed, and again, you'll see they're a little bit different building to building, and all the subgroups are in good standing. However, at the high school, they have a subgroup that scored a level one. So we have um, our black or African American students showed up as a chronic absenteeism group. That, that's a point of concern for the school that we have to address. Similarly, in the middle school, overall, it's in good standing. And overall, all the subgroups are in good standing, but they have Hispanics and Latinos are a potential TSI group. And you really need almost like a thesaurus to keep up with acronyms. So that means the, that subgroup is chronically low performing and they've been identified for additional support 
and are not making progress over a three-year time frame. So this is something that at the middle school we have to pay attention to. And then we can look at their different subgroups and how they perform. If you notice, there are five categories in the middle school that scored a level one. The school's in good standing, but these subgroups are a concern. So composite performance, which is based on the six, seven, eight math, ELA, and science, which is just eighth grade science. Growth, which is math and ELA. Um, performance and combined growth, which is math and ELA. Progress, which is math and ELA and absenteeism. And you can see we've identified a number of different subgroups in those things. And I'll get to what's going on at, at the end. Um, Cuga Heights, very similar to the previous two buildings. They're all in good standing. However, they also are having some groups identified as potential targets that scored level ones based on their subgroup standing. Again, it's, look, it's almost the exact same thing as the middle school. So as part of the consolidated grant each year, we have to look at the level one subgroups. We have to create a team of teachers and other staff to look at a variety of data that we have in house and sort of determine what are some of the issues that might be causing these subgroups to score level one. And then we have to come up with an action plan. And that's submitted with our consolidated grant on August 31st. So this is the second year we've had to go through that process. Um, so we have a plan for all three buildings to monitor and address these areas. And a lot of it will be done through their instructional leadership teams, the data teams, and, and then it trickles down to the individual staff that might be responsible for it. Um, and I'm, I just want to point out in the middle and high school, the greatest need, the thing that will wipe out four indicators, is increasing the number of students participating on the New York State assessments. And this is why. Because when we do the calculations and do the scores, the denominator would increase. So it's like the level twos plus one and a half times the level threes plus two times the level fours. It's divided by the number of continuously enrolled students that tested or 95% of all continuously enrolled students. So whichever is greater. So our denominator is 95% of all the kids were supposed to take the test because it's larger than the number of students tested. So no matter how well, even if all the kids who took the test got a four, dividing it by that large number is going to drive our scores down according to the state report card and the calculations based on ESSA. So that, that's a really big deal for both the middle and the elementary school. Um, do you want to hear a little bit about the plans for each indicator? Okay. Sure. Um, so Cuba Heights, um, we, we took a look at a lot of different things for those four areas that deal with academics. Um, and, and some of the things that the team found out to be most impactful in, in, as far as the testing goes is um, attendance. Obviously, you saw attendance was an issue with a couple subgroups. Um, the number of opt-outs, which I just spoke to, and, and new registrants and mobility. So we don't, the kids don't count unless they were here two years. So you have to be tested in fourth grade and then in fifth grade to get a growth measure. But new registrants, we have a lot of programs in place when the child transfers into the district to get them ready. And we do a lot of things with testing and AIS. Um, the committee felt that perhaps we need to extend those services to year two. You know, we have new student groups and we need to continue touching base with those students and, and looking at their AIS and really evaluating it. And Cuba Heights has got a great way of looking at AIS. They meet regularly. They look at all the different testing inside the school, but we need to focus in. And some of the things we're doing is like this year, we, we have specifically designed instruction that focuses on the gaps. And this year, it's a big deal because March to June, we know there's gaps in instruction. So we, we've done some things with that. And um, 
with the absenteeism at Cuba Heights because it was a, uh, an ethnic subgroup. You know, the teachers have focused on getting more instructional materials that are multicultural. And they're doing, you know, we have some internal resources for helping teachers with multicultural, multiculturalism, easy for me to say, and, and for really trying to make better connections with students that, you know, are from different cultures and ethnicities. Uh, this summer alone, there had been two or three book studies at Cuba Heights, all about those sort of things. So I think Cuba Heights has got a good start on it. Like I said, their building-based teams will be monitoring these groups as we go along. Um, at the middle school, you know, their biggest impact is the refusals. Um, and I, I know Mr. Lucchini had a plan last year. Um, we talked about him communicating, well, it could be he and Mrs. Girdlestone communicating with the stakeholder groups, the parents and the teachers, and sort of not just educating people about the testing and why it's so important to us, but also coming up with, with the way I know last year he had an incentivized approach, maybe revisiting that and seeing if it's plausible. Um, I think with good communication, this could have a positive impact. We, we've had some steady growth. Um, we skipped a year last year with testing, so we have no idea what we're up against, but we need to continue growing the number of students taking it. Um, again, at his building, they're looking at curriculum. They've met on curriculum, looking to improve filling in gaps. Um, they constantly look at their AIS, AIS list and, and how we can meet kids' needs and not make it so his child's in AIS for the whole year. If there's something that can be corrected, we can move the child out of AIS and allow them to you know, take the course again or you know, have flexible groupings, which is very important and it's something that um, we've talked about a lot. The middle school ELA departments also improved their class libraries so now they have even more high interest reading for the kids. Um, we're, we're investing more time into Readers and Writers Workshop. So we have a contiguous program, grades K to 12, where we have kids reading and writing and really trying to meet the needs uh, that are being asked of them. Um, at the high school, it's just absenteeism. But we know everything trickles up. So if we're struggling at the middle school with our test scores, or our, our achievement, that it will show up in a high school. And they, the high school's got some great programs for that. But with absenteeism, um, they're really looking at improving that through better parent communication, not just notification, but problem solving. Um, and again, this year poses some challenge was challenged to that with remote learning and hybrid learning. Um, looking at our resources like Detective, or Detective Hosfeld and seeing how we can utilize him to intervene and get the kids back engaged with classes. Because truly the only thing that's going to help these students succeed is, is good, solid, first-time instruction. Um, that's it in a nutshell. Any questions? Yes? Um, I'm just curious, what's the percentage of kids who are taking the class? If they're three to eight. Depends on the grade level. Um, our, and I don't have those off the top of my head. I you don't either, but I can you get know, But them. we can get those for you. Okay. We can get you the, the trends yeah. in the last several years. The Here biggest, the, the biggest non-participating groups are at the middle schools, the seventh and eighth graders, um, and then steadily extending that through time. Okay. Just yep. curious. Yeah, we can get that information for you. Thank you. I got one for you. Uh, two actually for you, Bill. Um, okay. First, I'm just curious why how the school suspensions is a factor compared to other things. Like why. Why are out of school suspensions? So they they're looking at that for specifically subgroups to, to determine if there are any uh, targeted subgroups that are suspended more than all. Okay. Yes. Uh, that's yeah. really why that came. Okay, and then my other I guess concern that jumped out at me and it hadn't occurred to me until I was watching this, but I would say that our area is probably at the higher risk of having a large contingency in to the economically disadvantaged group yep. that we're well, that, yep. in. And that's been going on for over 10 years. Yeah, but I'm thinking it might, in the next few months, yep. get larger. And how is that factored in to this? Well, it's a subgroup in and of itself, mm -hmm. economically disadvantaged.
disadvantaged. Um, how's the fact you're leaving us? Well, I guess what I'm asking is if we see a sudden spike in that, which I think is possible. In, in that population, you mean? In that population. Yeah, so how would we, how would we A, know it, and B, then how would we address well, it? Well, we would definitely know it just by, just by the family register. We get the, we get the information based on the application. Because they self-report, right? Correct. Right. Okay. Um, and then uh, coupled with that, we, we have been systemically dealing with it across the district for the last 10 years. When I first started here 10 years ago, um, you know, we were we were in a neighborhood of like 34, 35 percent community yeah, no We're way. at 50 now, yeah. um, and it's steadily, steadily, it's tick, up yeah, steadily ticking up. Um, we're not at 60 yet, but it's steadily ticking up. And um, and I, I could foresee the trajectory within the next five years between 60 and 100 percent. But our staff has been uh, and has gone through a tremendous amount of training. Um, we will be put paying. There's a lot of research and a lot of professional development involved in areas of poverty and understanding um, and, and responding to um, that whole culture um, and making sure that we're responsive uh, to the kids here in school. Um, a lot of the things that we've done um, systemically, you know, all the way up to the high school with the Brown Cap Prep and, and allowing kids to be engaged in the school, in other words, being, wanting to be here more than they want to be. That's really, I think, a, a lot to do um, with focusing on our, on our students and our community. Yeah, I'm personally familiar with like, homeless kids that we've yep. dealt with and kept them in school over yep. the past few years, but yep. I suspect that that's something we're going to see more of. Yes. We're also focusing a lot on social-emotional training. Yes. You know, we, we invested a lot of time in that this year alone, but it's been going on for years, where the teachers are becoming more aware of the basic needs of the kids and how it impacts their lack of impact education. So we've spent a lot of time talking about that, a lot of time learning about that. Um, we had two trainings run by a couple of our counselors this summer that had about 30 teachers participate. Every one of our teachers and all of our CSCA and DTEA employees had a basic training on that before we even opened the doors this year. On top of the teacher choice book studies, I know three book studies went out in middle school with teams of teachers. Because the better we can address the kids and the better we can build relationships with the kids, we can start bridging that gap caused by economics. Um, so we've been adjusting, you know, Dr. Raby said, you know, the statistics. When I first started, and I don't remember when that was, it was like 16 years ago, we had doubled we were at 24%, and that was a double from about eight years prior. So we've doubled twice since I've been. It's cascade. Yeah. yeah. And, and, that, and one of the things that um, the thought exchange has really done for us is, is give, he gave us a perspective of what's going on in our school community, not just around the pandemic, but overall what's happening. And the last thought exchange that we did was around the social emotional learning piece. And we used all that data for our opening. So we had um, uh, trainers from uh, through the uh, Leader to Me, which has been the initiative that started in Cuba, now is the middle school and the high school. And um, they came in for the full day, I think it was that Thursday, of our, our, our opening, our, our student event conference days. And they spent the entire day with our middle school and high school teachers all around equity and, and, and understanding social and emotional learning perspectives. And that, that, it, that spans that whole um, economic disadvantage group, not to mention the multicultural group. So um, we, we respond, and I, I think um, significantly to the needs that we're hearing, but we got to continue to do it. I mean, there's still a lot of work to do, and, and that's you know, what Mr. Lovato has been presenting on, you know, look at, looking at this data and the trends that are happening with regard to our achievement in those areas. But we also know about the other side of it, um, and that, that's what we uh, really focus on. Thank you. One question. Do you get any kind of feedback from like the parents from the families or the children that are yeah. not coming to teach? Yeah. 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 Um, do we get any kind of feedback from the parents or uh, from the, the students that are in these groups that are, um, the attendance is bad, or have you had any kind of feedback? 
feedback from you know, the groups about you know, maybe they, they need a little, little faith that we need to get our kids to get them to maybe participate in some of these tests and stuff like that. And is language a barrier in a lot of this stuff? So la language, <coughs> is, the ELL kids that we do get are usually the, the ones that attend school the best. Right. Um, they're highly motivated. They, you know, they want to improve their English language proficiency. Um, so, language isn't so much of a gap, I don't think. Um, feedback, and, and that's one of the things we've looked at is we told parents or kids were absent a lot, but we we need to do one of the improvement points is doing a better job of problem solving. And in, at the high school level, they do a fine job. They have Katie Malchewski. Who, who really reaches out to some of our most at-risk students. We have the Wildcat prep staff. They're highly trained. And, and they do a great job of building relationships and having that dialogue back and forth and meeting those individual kids' needs. And that, that would be our highest risk part of that group. Yeah. Um, and then we, we need to sort of trickle that down and start doing that with larger groups and really engaging the parents, like you're saying, John, and, and finding out why occasionally you know, a parent or a child will say, this is why I don't want to come to school. Um, sometimes it, it's it's taking care of a sick parent, which is something I dealt with last year. The young man could not come to school. Right. And, and, and one, of the, one of the things that I just, I just want to link, link that back, link John's question back to the board's support in the, in the last budget, in the budget development process, one of the positions that we prioritized was a, another school psychologist, which we're going to be taking next year. Uh, tonight, and that's going to go a long way, significant impact on, on assisting with these most vulnerable uh, populations. So, you have other questions? Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, John. <laughs> so, there's no other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zamato. Very informative. Appreciate that. Before I announce the First of our two public forums, I just want to repeat uh, the email for our district clerk, uh, Jessica Nyshell. Again, J Nyshell, N is in Nancy, E is in Edward, I S is in Sam, C is in Cat, H is in Harry, E is in Edward, L is in Larry. At twoschools.org, J Nyshell at twoschools.org. So if you have any questions, please submit them to her via email. If you don't get in the first public forum, we'll get another one. So here we are. This is the time in the board meeting agenda when district residents may address the Board of Education with their concerns. Each resident has up to three minutes to address the board. A total of 50 minutes will be allowed for each public forum. So if anyone does have a question, Jessica, do we have any? Uh, Not at this time. Not at this time? Okay. So there will be another forum. We'll take your questions at that time. If you have them, uh, bring us to our superintendent's report. Is there a report tonight, Dr. Reagan? There is real brief, just give the board an update on um, our phenomenal start. Uh, we started our soft opening last Wednesday with our students attending. Um, obviously, you know, with, with anything like this, uh, we had a, a, a few glitches here and there, but we've been ironing them out uh, collectively. Um, one of the biggest hurdles we had, which we knew we were going to have, and we would have to adjust along the way, was our um, dismissal. Um, and we've been shaving anywhere between three and five minutes off each day. In fact, today, um, the high school was out by 2.40ish, and the elementary school was done by 3.25. And I think that's pretty significant <coughs> in trying to, again, uh, reduce the amount of congestion with our students exiting the building and getting them on their modes of transportation, either the buses out back or um, the uh, parent pickup out front. So that is, is going along great. But Again, it's been a uh, complete team effort um, and uh, um, knock on wood. Um, I hope we can continue uh, being in school face to face with our kids. They love being here. Um, they are so excited every day coming to school. Almost all of them, one or two might have a little bit of a hard time getting out of the car, but um, we, we've, been, uh, we, we've been seeing a lot of uh, happy faces, even with their masks on. You can see it in their eyes. Encouraged to uh, keep doing this for as long as we possibly can. So, that's great news. We appreciate your work with both your staff and, of course, the teachers that uh, are here every day. Uh, really glad to see you. And 
person Next order of business on our agenda is the consent agenda. So may I have a motion to the Board of Education upon the recommendation of the superintendent to approve the consent agenda items as submitted. So moved. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Uh, motion is carried. I would like to recognize that we have appointed Rachel Rochelle Strickland to the tenure area of school psychologist. I want to welcome her to the school family and Next is new business, number one. I have a motion to the Board of Education upon the recommendation of the superintendent be it resolved that the Board of Education upon the recommendation of the District Audit Committee hereby accept the draft independent financial audit report pending that there are no material changes for the year ending June 30th, 2020 as presented by Drescher and Malecki, LLP. So moved. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Carried. Number two, I have a motion to the Board of Education upon the recommendation of the superintendent be it resolved that the board accepts the following donation of $1,000 from Lake Effect Baseball in support of the Pew Athletics of the Spurs Hatch. So moved. Second. Any questions? Please. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Number three, I have a motion to the Board of Education upon the recommendation of the superintendent be resolved that the board accepts the following donation of $100 in the Great American Rivalry Series in support of the Pew Athletics of Spurs Hatch. So Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion is almost also carried. Time again for the public forum. As a reminder, this is the time that the board meeting agenda the district residents may address the Board of Education with their concerns. Each resident is up to three minutes to address the board. A total of 15 minutes will be allowed for each public forum. Again, that email is jnishel at the pewschool.org. Jessica, do we have any questions at this time? No, we do not. The person who asked for their, e asked for their email did not send any questions? Or was that one? Or was that the person asking? They were not in the meeting. They were not live. Okay. Somebody contacted you and asked you. No. Okay. No, no questions though at this time? No, I have no questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, that brings us to comments and remarks by board members. Well, the last meeting I expressed concern about the drop off and the congestion. Jeff told me there was nothing to worry about, and I'm happy to report that because I don't know how to set an alarm clock, I got to experience it. Yeah, Cayuga Heights, and it was absolutely great. Good. They, it's really nice. In fact, you should probably keep that forever. Yeah. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah. It literally was like clockwork. It ran really well. I, I have to say that. Um, what day did you do that? Uh, I want to say well, it was probably last Friday. Last Friday. So uh, we initially we changed it a little bit from the very beginning because um, you were part of the snaky, right? Yeah. Right. So that first. So, that, right, so uh, I have to publicly thank uh, Scott Hostel for waking up at 2 in the morning and coming up with that idea. So he claims it was his, I think it might have been his wife's, but um, and anyway, uh, he, he came up with that idea to get the traffic moving uh, through smoother, so that, that helped significantly. Yeah, it really was. Um, and like I said, we're making improvements every day. So. That was real nice, and to... to your point that the kids were excited to see. I got to watch the teachers going and getting, especially the smaller kids yep. out. Of Kara was tying her shoe, but the girls stopped. <laughs> but it was nice to watch. You could see that the kids were very excited. Thank you. Trustee Spencer, did you remember your question? Uh, actually, yes, I did. <laughs> um, hey, Mr. Tabata. I'm um, sorry. With when we get these ratings because of the issues we have with these school buildings, does that affect us budgetarily? Uh, are we uh, anything taken away from us or anything more mandated on us to do within our budget? So, uh, as of right now, we 
you have not lost any state aid. There has been threats in the past uh, that that could potentially happen. I don't see that on the horizon as of yet. However, where it does impact us financially is, is having to put in the resources and the supports um, so that we, we can um, mitigate all of, all of the subgroups that, that the target includes that are that are insufficient. So, um, in essence, yes, we have to um, put more resources to, to that end. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just heard through the grapevine with um, how good it's going with the high school and the middle school. But personally, I have a fourth grader and a second grader, and I've never seen two kids so excited <laughs> to come to go to school and come home. And instead of getting the what did you do today, pull out the same stuff, I'm getting a whole litany of events. I just want to commend the staff. I welcome them back. They are, my kids are so ecstatic to be back in school. It's really, I mean, they like school to begin with. They just love having some part of their routine back, and I know how hard everyone's worked to kind of bring that back. Like I said, I've heard from family and friends that the high school and middle school are doing a great job, too, but personally, the Rango Heights is doing an outstanding job. Thank you. Thanks. You know, piggyback off that, I think it eager to be said, sorry, that uh, to piggyback off that, I think it needs to be said that, you know, I think we all get to see through our jobs a wide array of different people at districts, and um, I think we're pretty well ahead of the game around the entire nation. I, I don't, I haven't heard much about Lancaster, but I don't know what other it's going good. It's seems going to be going good, but um, the, the, the soft opening idea is something I think more people probably should I was thinking I should wear this to work tonight. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> so, <laughs> double dog dairy. Jeff, I think you and your staff should, should relish the fact that you're leading from the front. It's something that more people probably should have done and have alleviated a lot of those horror stories that we've heard about. I mean, sure, technological issues are there, but you certainly can prepare the families and kids a lot better. And also, I mean, I'll speak to the, all the technological people, Jessica and all, all the other staff. You know, all the feedback I've gotten, and I've gotten more than I usually get, it's been nothing but good. Good. It's good. Really, good. It really has been outstanding. And you guys have all done a great job. And again, you know, uh, I, I want to stress how much of it was a team effort, right? You know, we started right from uh, the uh, end of June uh, in doing the actual lifting. But the conversations and, and the lessons that we were learning were happening all through the spring. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what if we have to keep doing this? What's it going to look like? What are we going to take note of? And uh, that that feedback in those meetings that we were having on an ongoing basis we were consistent in that development and that discussion. And then, and then again, I, I, I think a, a big portion <laughs> of our um, development of our plan was the feedback we were getting from those community through those thought exchanges, uh, that, that helped shape, especially that initial draft plan. The amount of feedback that we got from that uh, really helped shape our final plan. We were hearing from the parents and the students and the teachers, this isn't going to work. you got to do this differently. You know, I think two of the key ones that jumped out at me were, was the temperature piece, right? You know, initially we were putting the onus on just the parents. Well, we found out that the parents really weren't trusting their parents. They wanted the school to do it too. So we, we committed to doing that. Um, and then the other one was um, if we had to um, reduce our capacity any further and trying to spread out our population, the, the, one of the scenarios was to put the high school um, in full remote and then splitting the elementary and middle school students across the three buildings. And one of the ideas was to um, shift the, um, some of the middle schoolers up to the high school shift the uh, elementary to the, to the middle school. And they didn't like that idea of having to shift two buildings, right? Mm -hmm. Rather, um, we said, okay, fine, we'll, we'll bring the younger kids up to the high school. That way we won't have to disrupt yeah. too many lives. So we took that feedback. We adjusted our plan. Those are just two of the things, but there were, there were several others. And, and I've, said, I've said a number of times to the faculty and staff and, to, and through the media that this isn't my plan, this isn't your plan, this isn't the teacher's plan. This is the school community's plan because truly the school community built the plan. Um, and, and it was all through.
and then we enter this conversation. And we're still, you know, like like I said, we're tweaking things each day, making it a little bit more, making it better, more efficient, more effective. And uh, probably within, probably not uh, the end of this week, but probably the end of next week, we'll, we're going to make some adjustments to our plan. And we'll highlight and we'll put them in yellow, the things that we're, that we're changing. But it's really, we've already kind of changed them a little bit in our opera operationally, and we just got to get it documented in the plan. Um, one of the things, one of the key things was in the plan, it talks about um, unloading and loading one bus at a time. Well, that recommendation, when, when I uh, did some uh, background uh, research on that, came about from the Department of Health thinking that we would have 20 to 30 kids on a bus. We don't have 20 to 30 kids on a bus. We have anywhere, depending on the bus, more than 8 to 12 kids on a bus. So right there, and, and that's really part of how we're able to be more efficient in our dismissal, we're now looking at two, three buses at a time. Because we don't have that many kids coming off those buses, uh, going on those buses. So those are the kind of things that we're tweaking along the, along the way. And one of the things I talked about with regard to lockers with middle school and high school, right now we're not letting them use them. But if we can figure out a way where we can have them use not pondering it, because that's the big thing, is the congregation. Uh, we may look at doing that, especially when, you know, when the snow flow starts falling in the next two weeks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> tonight. Uh, yeah, tonight. Uh, so th those are the things that we're going to constantly look at and make adjustments. And, and hopefully, like I said, uh, my message that I, I sent out to the parents every uh, Sunday night is we're doing everything we possibly can to stay face-to-face -face with Just uh, want to do a shout out to the community too. Uh, the weeks leading up to this, we're plan A, plan B, all this stuff's coming up. Um, I'm not a big social media person, but I do talk to it. There were a lot of people that said, "Just wait and see what, how it goes." And it, it, it did help settle some of the nerves for a lot of people. And uh, you got to thank people for not jumping on one bandwagon to get one thing or the other. They just waited to see. students who are remote now after they're coming over 10 weeks right 20 first 20 weeks okay what if all of them want to come back and we have nobody with them is there room for everybody that that we'd have to evaluate that right so we would have to see where our numbers are right now um, we are very tight on our hybrid kids in the elementary classrooms because one of the things we have to do and that's why we have to have people Commit to that remote because once we pull that teacher out of the grade level teaching, and again, I'll just make say third grade. We have that one teacher teaching those remote third graders. If they start to want to come back into a hybrid third grade, that then puts our numbers over on one of the you know the uh, A through L or M through Z days. So that's why we're we're saying you, you can't come in until the twenty weeks, um, and then if we do it. We'll do another survey in December to see if, if folks want to come back in or not or stay remote. Um, then we're going to have to make an adjustment to that. Um, we would we would have we would have room depending on the grade level um, and the availability of a particular teacher in any one. Classrooms I'm not so worried about because we, we can put a remote a remote only teacher um, anywhere to, to be doing that, that instruction. Um, it's more about the staff. start to mess with the numbers, after you get a balance with the capacity and face-to-face, -face, um, it becomes a problem. So, so you, we would have the room for the kids, mm -hmm. but the staffing would be the issue. Right. Could be. Could be. Right. Again, we won't know until we see the numbers. Yep. Well, yeah, we plan on doing more thought exchanges once we get uh, rolling through that's the library. That's a great idea to hear what the public has to say. Absolutely. Yep. And, and you know, again, we, that's what we've been doing, so the public's used to that. In fact, all the remote teachers um, this uh, last week and, and through this week are
are making contact with all of those families, making the connection, talking about what to expect next week when remote learning starts officially on September 21st. So those connections are already uh, being made, and they're starting to pick up some of the material so that they have that uh, for the kids at home. So yeah, it's been it's been pretty good so far. Thank you, everybody. May I now have a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Motion is carried. The meeting is adjourned.